Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined today by Tom Barrett, who is the CEO of Engine Lease Finance. Um, Tom, thanks again for agreeing to chat to us today. Um, before we get into the questions, might, you might tell uh, just some of our watchers, most of whom will know, a little bit about Engine Lease Finance and where they sit in the aviation world. Okay. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity today. Um, engine Lease Finance, we're one of the veterans of engine leasing. We've been in business since 1990, um, and uh, we pride ourselves on being uh, the largest independent engine lessor um, with a portfolio of well over $2 billion, and as such, um, own or manage um, just over 300 engines. Um, Outside of the, the manufacturer-owned um, concerns, we probably um, ourselves and one or two other veterans could be the, the long-standing competition for the, for the industry. Tom, we've obviously had, uh, we're, we're, I should say we're recording this in the middle of December. Um, it's been an incredible year from a number of different aspects. Looking at you know, your company and performance over that period of time, and the interaction with your customers. Where do you sit now as we're in month nine, 10 of the pandemic? How has that performance with your customers evolved over the course of 2020 as you've dealt with the challenges that you've faced? Um, it's, it's been like nothing we've seen before. It's, you know, anyone on any level, this pandemic has been on a scale for so much of the world and certainly aviation industry um, beyond the, the level of anything. Um, we've had many regional type uh, crises in the past that have greatly affected one region or another, but starting back in February, we began to see, um, starting in the east, uh, aircraft being grounded, airlines see, um, stopping operation, cutting back capacity, and um, then it moved from the east through Europe and ultimately to the Americas. And so by probably the end of the second quarter, we were in discussions with virtually all of our customers about the furrows of some kind or some way to assist them through the crisis. So it's been, um, that was a kicker. And um, then I suppose Q3, we saw, I mean, in July, you know, which was probably what, four or five months into it, we began to see, you know, people were coming up for air. There was some optimism, uh, particularly in Europe, um, that capacity could be put back on in July and August as airlines um, saw the, the first wave of restrictions begin to lift. But um, it struck me greatly when I, I took a couple of weeks off in August and it really struck me when I came back that it was gone into reverse in a big, big way. And uh, I think since August, um, many of the markets have only seen declines with the obvious exception of, you know, great big holiday period like um, Thanksgiving in the United States. And I see some capacity going back on again now in Europe and other markets where there will be seasonal bump. But um, even with um, the capacity that's gone back on, it's been mainly focused domestic. And in doing that, you know, I think with the exception of China, even all the domestic markets are all reporting significant uh, downward um, cuts in capacity and uh, international is pretty much non-existent at the moment. So, And have you faced the same challenges that we've seen on the aircraft leasing side, requests for deferrals, restructurings of lease commitments? How has that been uh, as one of the largest engine lessors? Um, yes, uh, you know, at times during the year, it, it was like every day there was more bad news, more uh, relentless pressure on, on all of those things. But, you know, engine lease finance, there's a reason we've been around for 30 years and successful for 30 years. Um, you know, we engage with all our customers um, and that's dialogue. That's working with them, not against them. You know, um, the customers where we had mandates to close business, we closed the business, um, proving, you know, a lifeline to some of those customers in the circumstance. Um, and in the, um, you know, the engagement around deferrals, we've certainly worked um, with them all, 
with a view to the long-term relationships and the fact that we know this will pass. You know, maybe the vaccine is, is the form of, uh, you know, trigger, but, you know, it's going to take some time. But we know many of our existing customers who are in tough times today will be around for the long haul and we'll be there to support them, as we always do. And, and in looking at that customer side, you know, we have seen relatively few airline failures, given the scale uh, of the impact that the pandemic has had. Um, a lot of it driven to the significant government support that's been, been put out there. Uh, as you look forward, maybe over the next six months, what's your expectation on the airline fa failure side? Do, do, do you think we will see more? Do you think that government support will be strong enough to keep a lot of them in business? For some, for sure, the, you know, the government, the government has been the savior of the airlines that are still operating. Um, you know, most, not all, and there's been some pockets where governments have been unable or unwilling to support their airline businesses. But generally speaking, um, the failure, um, that number of failures has been as low as you described, Joe, because of the government support. Um, through the next six months, you know, I think now the, maybe perhaps there's a small sense of optimism or if not quite optimism, the fact we're getting through this and that will continue, I think, as the, um, the vaccine begins to get rolled out globally in larger numbers. Um, I think inevitably the government's going to have to sit back and think, where does the resource go, you know, in many ways they've been able to almost uh, write blank checks to support industry in many of the economies of the world, not all, obviously. And um, the government's going to have to begin with the passing of the peak of the crisis, perhaps focus on what they need to do to recover. And that will, I think, have consequences for the level of support the airlines can expect to receive in the future. And as you look then maybe on, on the new transaction side, uh, you know, over the last nine months or so, how challenging has it been for you in assessing new transactions, airline credit worthiness? And maybe you could tell us a little bit of, is there a fundamental difference in the type of deals you're writing now to the ones maybe you were writing 12 months ago? Um, yes and, and no. Um, the business for Angelese Finance, and why I say yes and no, the business for Angelese Finance is about the asset we're an asset investor, we're not a financier in our opinion. And as an asset investor, you know, we will invest in the right asset and have always done, trust, done so through all the cycles. You know, up and down through the last 30 years, we have invested in good assets and we'll continue to do that. So that stands. Vis-a-vis -vis the customer, naturally, you know, you've got to look more cautiously at every customer. And in doing so, um, you know, yes, government ownership is perceived as a strong plus um, at the moment, naturally, um, for the reasons just described. Um, you know, naturally, immediate cash flow is seen as vital. You know, the ability through the next six months, um, you know, there's probably a focus on that that we wouldn't have had previously, though, you know, frankly, you would have expected if you're doing business with the customer that six months was uh, not an issue. In terms then of the um, the only other area we probably look at a little bit differently is the emphasis of domestic to international, because um, it's clear the recovery um, in the pockets there have seen some we have seen some recovery that the domestic has been um, you know a safer bet than international business and uh, while I think international business is going to return it will take quite some time for the trust and the, um, the governments of the world to, again, open up their international uh, airports and so on. And, and in looking at, at the debt side, um, Tom, you guys obviously have a strong shareholder, excellent liquidity behind you. But looking with your ELF hat on, but, but also in the broader aviation finance market, what's your outlook in both looking at maybe the traditional aviation bank market and, and also the capital markets, which have proven very resolute for aviation finance, even through the thick of this crisis. What, what are your thoughts around those areas and the challenges that might come out of uh, the, the finance side for aviation finance? Well, I think pricing will be one. 
you know, there's there's no doubt that traditional banks have to look at aviation a bit more cautiously than they have in the past. You know, there will be a flight to quality. I think for engineers finance and you know the premium resources who've been doing this for a while, I think there will be um, you know, a flight to quality among not just the airlines, but among the lesser community as well. So but you know, you're you're right, Joe. It has been more resolute, um, largely let's appreciate the quantum of easing that's going on globally at the moment. Um, you know, again, that blank check I might have referred to that the governments are spending, you know, a lot of it is thanks to the quantum of easing. And I think a lot of the the finance that is available um, in the community is through the very aggressive quantum of easing going on globally um, to get people through the crisis. Um, in terms of where it goes from here, I think that traditional banks, and there was probably, when we spoke a year ago, uh, quite ahead of steam where everybody wanted to be in aviation, banks included, I think clearly that will uh, reduce somewhat as we come out of this crisis. And I think um, it will be potentially the stronger, more established SRs who should benefit from um, what might become more scarce resource. And, and who do you see maybe plugging that gap? So if you have a situation where you, you, you do have a step back from some of the traditional banks, the large guys could tap unsecured, um, but you've got a whole layer in behind or a secondary market that's there. And um, how do you see that playing out? Or do you have thoughts over who might step in to fill that funding gap? Um, I can't really predict where it'll come from yet, Joe. Uh, the reason being, I think it's too early in the cycle. The industry um, doesn't know which way to look at the moment. Um, you know, will we be recovered in two years, three years, four years? And the jury's out much of that. Um, in terms of new investors, you know, I think the, the new investors will be many of the old investors. I think the ones who probably left the market when the yields got as tight as they've done over the last few years and didn't see the value for money, some of those people will be the aggressive participants. But um, I think it's too early to say with any certainty. And, and just briefly, one more thing on the funding side. Probably not a market that's been hugely relevant to DLF in the past, but we have seen some engine transactions is, is, it, is around ABS. And it's become a, a really important channel for financing. We talk about these alternative sources, understandably closed at the moment. Where were your thoughts on where that market might go and, and when it might return? I think you're looking at least 12 months away, um, maybe longer. I think uh, the ABS market in the quantity that was um, been funded through that source, um, you know, will go for a while. It's it's tended, in my experience of the various cycles over the years, is that ABS tends to come in when the cycle is well established. There's a degree of confidence. You know, I don't think the airlines, who ultimately are the customers for all of us in this industry, um, I don't think the airlines are going to be able to um, access the cheap. Uh, rentals they will need from lessors if the lessors will be funded through ABS because I think when ABS does come back it's going to be uh, at higher cost of funds for sure. And shifting gears maybe on the manufacturing side Tom, um, there have been challenges maybe focusing on the engine side that there's been lots of challenges on the manufacturing side as there has been uh, on the aircraft side. How has the pandemic impacted uh, on the OEM side for engines and, and how do you see that playing out? Um, it's been huge. I, you know, I can't speak uh, to in, in any great detail about Airbus or Boeing because that's not our space. But in terms of the engine OEMs, it's been huge. You know, I think certainly whether the numbers are official or not, what we um, have seen is they're producing less than half the engines this year than might have been expected. Now, that admittedly was on the back of um, a ramp up in production expected by both the aircraft manufacturers and the engine manufacturers, but they've you know had to cut staff um, and they've to face into reality that the production will probably remain cut for at least next year, if not a little bit further. So 
I think that's a huge planning issue for manufacturers who after all, we should remember that is their prime focus to manufacture these new technology engines. Um, in terms then of what might change for them, um, you know, I think they'll refocus um, all of their efforts on the production piece. I think the other parts of the business that has been built up um, over the years through the various cycles, um, you know, has got to come in for some consideration um, at the manufacturer level. But, you know, the core engine production will be the priority for the next while and getting that back to the level that they've seen before. Obviously, that kind of feeds into the demand supply dynamic and they say we're in an oversupply piece here. How do you see that? How do you see that impacting it? If again, I think everyone's of a view that, that we will come out of this. The question is how long that will take. But but that that slowdown of production is so slow, as you mentioned, to, to get to ramp back up. How do you see that impacting the demand supply dynamic beyond this crisis? Maybe looking out 12, 24 months. Um, in macro terms, I think we won't be too worried about a shortage of engines um, for some time because I think globally there's so much capacity to come back into the system. You know, you put together all of the parked aircraft, all of the uh, the new maxes that were manufactured that with that now uh, beginning to be approved for entry into service, they'll come into service. So there is going to be plenty um, of aircraft and engines available to people for the next while. Um, but there will be pockets. And I think this comes back to where maybe some of the investors who might return to the market, the experienced investors, you know, like ourselves in engineering finance, we will continue to invest through this uh, recovery, um, but it will be from quality. And I think that's probably, you know, that's not radical. Everybody could name the narrow body aircraft that are most attractive and it follows with the engines. But I think it's not to say that the, the NG and the CO are finished. They will be flying. They will be um, delivering an awful lot of capacity to the market for many years to come. And um, you know, we've, we're ready to play our part in that as the supply demand comes back into some kind of equilibrium. And, and on that, I talked to some of those older aircraft, you probably see an acceleration of some retirements. Mm -hmm. um, by a few years, maybe more than a few years. What does that mean in the engine leasing market? So, you know, you might be pushing to a part out, but, but have an engine that has a reasonably long life, presumably left in it. How are you thinking about that, Tom? Or how's, how's that going to play out? I think we can, you know, clearly engine lease finance invests in engines, narrow body, wide body, and all of the manufacturers, major manufacturers. So, you know, we will have some engines more greatly affected by uh, what you described, Joe, in terms of the early uh, part out or uh, uh, retirement. However, again, and largely based on previous experience, you know, as the capacity returns, and, and you know, I think the whole aviation community has got to see more coordination by governments in bringing that capacity back. It's going to be vital. But as the capacity returns, those aircraft are many of those stored aircraft are going to be required. There's no question about that. In terms of the dynamics of engines, that creates opportunity. There, there will be pockets, you know, a new AD can create a pocket of demand and an engine that we might not have predicted um, heading into the next cycle. Um, there will be, um, you know, pockets where uh, return to service will be more challenging, creating, you know, short term these opportunities. And I think as long as you've got the right infrastructure to react to that, and as long as you've got the, um, the professional team who've developed relationships with the airline customers over the years, along with your various partners and so on in the industry and um, in the MRO shops elsewhere, I think um, most of the, what I describe as the workhorses um, of the engine business, you know, the 7B, the uh, 5B, the A5, they've got a good life yet. And looking maybe on the distress piece, Tom, we've seen, we talked about airline piece where a lot of them have been propped up from a government perspective, um, but they've kind of 
fed that into the leasing community through the deferral requests we spoke about. Um, that will, you would expect, have a tail of distress feeding into the leasing side. But we've seen very few formal debt restructurings in the leasing side. Obviously, you, you, you had NAC go through their very public scheme arrangement, but not a whole lot else. Do you think we're going to see more of that over 2021? Do you think eventually the crunch will start to feed through uh, into the leasing community? I think it has to, Joe. Um, I've been, just as we've been surprised by the lack of airline, the level of lack of airline failures, but, you know, understanding that much of that has been due to government um, support. I've been really surprised at the lack of maybe higher profile, lesser um, stories to hit the press. I wouldn't say it's necessarily proof that there will be, um, because if there's one thing about this cycle, it's uh, it's um, forced us all, I think, not to predict to uh, to to certain. But from my point of view, um, I would imagine there's a lot of conversations going on. There has to be, you know, the, the kind of cash flows that have dried up for many of the lessors. Um, New and, new and established lessors um, has an impact. You know, nobody predicted the extent of this. Some of us were perhaps predicting, you know, it was going to come off the, the top of the cycle as it, as it was always going to do, but not the extent of this. Um, so yes, I think there will be a little, there's undoubtedly pressure. And I think for those that haven't been levered correctly, and maybe that's been one of the big changes we've seen this time, maybe some previous crisis, a lot of the lessors have managed to do the leveraging correctly, but I think the maturity is to come in the next 12 months will put some pressure on some of those lessors. And, and that probably feeds into the opportunity side, like the stress will, will push some opportunities and, and people who enter at the right stage of any cycle will obviously do very well financially out of it. What are you seeing out in the market now around the opportunity piece? Maybe looking at, at the engine type environment, is, is it a similar focus around sale and lease banks? We've talked about that wall of capital that's out there. On, on the opportunity side, what are your thoughts? I think they'll come from every pocket of the industry. Um, you know, from our point of view, I really do look forward to a lot of opportunity. You know, we, we do remain, and it's been reaffirmed investment grade through this cycle, you know, we've got a strong parent, as you mentioned earlier, Joel, and with that uh, combination, it does give us the opportunity to be really competitive on the sale and lease back. You know, there, our ability, when the right assets are involved, to do a good deal with the airline customers, we think will present tremendous opportunities on the sale and lease back. The airlines, some of them who maybe have uh, not done operating leasing for some time will begin to be more interested in it as we come out of this crisis. Um, across the uh, other opportunities, clearly the manufacturers would welcome um, uh, orders right now. Um, as we've seen you know, on the aircraft side with the uh, high profile Ryanair or the Boeing, um, and the engine manufacturers would be no different. In addition, the, um, the leasing community, I think some of the lessors will uh, present some opportunities and uh, you know, we're, we're placed in you know, 2011. Um, we bought the Macquarie engine portfolio and I think we remain well placed and positioned through this period to pursue many of those same type of opportunities. And, and picking up two of those threads, is the first, do you, do you think there's a chance of a material change in the percentage of these engines? So you talk to some of the aircraft, lessors would have a view that ultimately look at the debt levels that have been taken on are going to be very challenging on the capital side. Therefore, the leasing channel makes sense on the aircraft side. Do you see that being materially a uh, material shift as well on the engine side? Um, take, maybe just take that question first. Yeah, it will shift. I think, you know, if there was concern, which we would have had that bank financing was, you know, maybe encroaching on what might have been a growth uh, profile for, for leasing, I think that now is going into reverse. I think there will be more leasing. I don't think it'll be radical though, Joe. You know, I, I, it takes a lot to move that dial one, two, three percent 
and um, I wouldn't uh, predict a massive move to it. Um, but there will be, um, I think, some growth in the percentage of recent for sure. And then you mentioned some opportunities around that store. Is if you end up with, you know, part outs and but maybe more engines in the market. Do you see there potentially be more engine lessors uh, over the next couple of years to tr try and deal with potentially excess supply that some of the lessors have? How, how do you see that playing out? I think uh, entirely new entrant would be, uh, it would be a difficult time to contemplate it. You know, I think from the existing lessor community, I think one of the things about engines compared to aircraft is, um, you know, they're smaller, they're smaller ticket and they're a lot more complex. You know, the effort put into an aircraft lease, documentation, technically, and so on, you know, in the engine side, we put in as much effort to an asset that is a fraction of price. So I think for new entrants from the existing lesser aircraft leasing community, it might be difficult for them in the midst of this crisis to do so. In terms of the um, new entrants entirely, I'm not sure. You know, there are people out there who do like to take a punt on the, you know, the cyclical nature of this industry, and some may do so, but I think the barrier to entry for engine leasing is quite high because of the technical nature of the asset. So, you know, there might be one or two names we talk about in the next few years, but I'm, I would not expect it to be right. And, and maybe coming back to the opportunity theme, um, there's this wall of capital out there. There's so much general liquidity in the wider market, looking to find a home, chasing yield. Um, as we look out more over the longer term, as you say we move through this crisis, and, and the capital we require to fund the aviation finance space, where do you see that coming from? Do you think we're likely to see people who've been in it before have become more sophisticated around it? Or do you think we'll have a new category type of investor that, that might come in over the coming years? I don't see a new cat, an entirely new category. Um, you know, there are pockets of capital, as you say, and quite a lot of it that will want to be invested, but I'm not sure it's going to be running to aviation, at least until the recovery is more sustained. You know, the fundamentals of the aviation have probably been hurt um, more than most in industries, and I think it'll take a while people have the confidence to come into new entrants on I mean. Looking maybe at a, a topic that's taken a back seat, understandably over the course of this year, but will, I think, come back up high on the agenda pretty soon is around ESG, climate change. What are your thoughts on how that returns and how the pandemic might have impacted, you know, ESG and aviation? And a second prong to that probably area is, 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 is the industry as a whole, and that goes back to lessors, OEMs, airlines, doing enough to talk about the good things that the sector is doing in reducing its carbon footprint? Um, I think the industry was beginning to do the right things um, and beginning to talk uh, up some of the progress. Um, you know, but let's acknowledge in the midst of the crisis, it's about survival. And, you know, again, to go back to our customers at the outset, it's about the survival of the airlines. That's where it all has to start. So I think, you know, a lot of the objectives of the various um, sectors within the industry um, will have to take a backseat for a little while. But I think in terms of the overall direction of the industry, it will come back. Um, in, as the recovery uh, gains momentum. Um, you know, clearly the newer equipment and the fuel efficiency there will be important. There's a lot more that can be done structurally in the industry. And I think, you know, some of that will be back on the governments again um, to do so, to make the industry more efficient, to, you know, again, assist with fuel efficiency, perhaps um, through scheduling and so on. But, uh, in terms of, you know, it's been interesting to see that there's been some pockets of government uh, government injections um, aligned with 
um, this area and improve fuel efficiency and so on. I think as we come out of this, though, it'll take a little bit of time for that to be back on the agenda as strongly as it was before. Um, the next year or two is about survival and stabilizing. And I think then we begin to see that come true. Now, I'm also encouraged that you know many of the manufacturers who do have the obvious pressure that we've described earlier um, are still you know putting time and effort into the advancements. So you know whether it'll accelerate them, I'm not so sure because I think there will be uh, restrictions and potential for um, huge amounts of R&D in that area. But um, they are still moving forward with many of their programs, which is good news. And from an ENF perspective, in looking at that agenda, its primary focus, I guess, is shift towards newer tech equipment. And that's the best way of you putting your best foot forward is this agenda probably impacts the sector more widely. I think so. You know, like um, I'm reminded that a year ago in the Dublin conference, um, through our sponsorship with Erlen Economics, we were able to make it, uh, I think the right expression was carbon neutral. Um, so, you know, I think from that point of view, there'll be things like that. Engineers find to continue to support, whether it's, um, you know, at, in, in whatever way we can. But in terms of, you know, anything significant, it's about the newer technology. You know, uh, let's, let's be clear, the leasing community is not going to change the dial radically. We're a service provider. And I think in doing it, um, it is going to be the newer technology equipment um, that will make a, a more sustained impact. Just in closing, Tom, as you look out into 2021, what are your optimism levels like? Uh, and you know, high, low, medium, <laughs> but, but, but what are your thoughts? And, and maybe just with your, your ELF hat on, as you look out after what has been an extremely challenging year, how do you see next year going? And, and, and what are your levels around? Um, I think it, it, it moves, Joe, <laughs> it, it, not, not quite daily, but I'm really um, convinced that, you know, the future, as the recovery takes hold, it will be a strong recovery. Um, I can't say when that will happen, you know, will it be six months, 12 months or longer, I think, but there will be a sustained recovery. And I think for engineers finance, um, you know, we've got the tools in place to be able to support that recovery. And again, support those customers, all of those airlines that will need, you know, sale and leaseback activity, leasing activity, um, whatever. So I'm optimistic because I think we've been doing this for so long and we have a team with the experience and the relationships and, you know, the people who have maybe joined us in this industry in the last, you know, five, 10 years have learned so much in the last year. Not what we'd have chosen, but it is the experience, uh, the combined experience for our team that really gives me confidence. Tom, I'd like to thank you for your great insights today and wish you and Angelis Finance the best over the coming year. Thanks again. Thank you.